Good morning. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Living Hope Online Zoom. Um, so before we get started, let's go ahead and pray, okay? Father, we thank you so much for the mercy that you have shown, not just to me or to each person in this gathering, Lord, but for all of mankind. We thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for showing us, revealing to us what you would have us learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to continue on this topic of mercy. And last week, um, we learned more about God's mercy and how he showed mercy on David, even after David had sinned by taking Bathsheba. Um, it's, a, it's really a beautiful story of how God is willing to forgive and show mercy. But, you know, think about this. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. So why wouldn't he show David mercy? Listen to what Samuel says to Saul in 1 Samuel 13. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then in Acts 13, Paul says, uh, has this to say about David. He says, verse 22, And when he removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. You and I might be thinking that there is no way God will show mercy on us like he did, David. After all, that is there anybody walking around behind us saying, man, this, this guy is, or this gal, or this guy is uh, a person after God's own heart? Uh, so think about it. If, if, man after, if a man after God's own heart can fall so quickly and so far, we most certainly are capable of similar failures. We're not going to go through the whole story of David and Bathsheba account today. But if you want a refresher, Chuck did an amazing job last week. And, and um, I would encourage you to watch that um, online. Um, but what I want to do today is revisit 2 Samuel 11.1. 1, because I think this verse sets the stage for every, everything that follows. In the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So in the previous chapter, we see that David fought against the Arameans and routed them because they were helping the Ammonites. Now the spring came and it was time when the kings went off to war. Going to battle in the spring is not a commandment that I could find but it seems as though it is expected that the king would be leading his army. The Bible rarely mentions the season of spring, but it is used significantly in regard to when kings go to battle in the Old Testament. We see the prophet of God warning the king of Israel that he will be attacked by the king of Syria when spring comes. Sure enough, King Bed-Hadad of Syria will attack when spring comes. This, you can find that story in 1 Kings 20. Nebuchadnezzar embarks on a campaign against King Hezekiah of Judah in the spring of the year. And there, there was a reason that nations fought wars in the springtime, and it wasn't because they lived an agrarian lifestyle. One of the main reasons fought in springtime was the weather. The ground started to dry out, and the rainy months of winter would allow troop movement. In the winter months, chariots and anything with wheels would have been stuck in the mud and the troops would have gotten wet and cold. The summer months would have been way too hot. So they have a small window to fight their wars. And in David's time, one of the king's duties is to go out to war. We see in First and Second Samuel, David's main job was to fight, win victories, protect Israel, and expand its territory. But this particular spring, David sent Joab out with his men and the whole Israelite army to finish off the remaining Ammonites. And Joab and the whole army of David went out and they were successful in destroying them. And they besieged Rabbah, which was their capital city. 
So David neglected his responsibility as the leader of Israel when he remained in Jerusalem. By not leading his men into battle, he was not fulfilling his role as the leader or king. He stayed in Jerusalem, and as king, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So let's look at the various transgressions of David that led up to the point where Nathan told a parable in which David finally admitted his wrongdoing. There might be more sins, but we're going to look at the obvious commandments he broke. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. David broke this law as he so coveted his neighbor's wife that he would steal, kill, and commit adultery. You shall not give false witness. David tries to make this baby in the womb of Bathsheba look like it's Uriah's baby, but Uriah wouldn't go home to his wife. You shall not steal. David stole the wife of his neighbor and trusted friend Uriah, as Nathan clearly pointed out in the story of the lamb. You shall not commit adultery, the clearest of all of David's law-breaking here. You shall not murder. David sent the murderer request to Joab, so it was not his sword, but the arrows of others David used. But it was his desire that Uriah be killed. So this is quite the laundry list of David's violations, and he broke the part of the Ten Commandments. He broke number six through ten. And you might be saying to yourself, hey, at least I haven't done all of those things. But what did Jesus say when he gave the Sermon on the Mount? In Matthew chapter 5, he said, If you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing there, the, the whole of the, the Mount on, Sermon on the Mount, but this text doesn't tell us why David decided to stay home. But the author puts this piece of information in there because it is not inconsequential when we consider the rest of the story and what happened. It's in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. What David didn't realize is that it was in Jerusalem where he would fight the biggest battle of his life. In the comfort of his palace, lust gripped him like a lion or a bear might grip its prey. In the comfort of his palace, his desire for Bathsheba loomed larger than his desire to defeat Goliath. In the comfort of his palace, and unlike Saul's spears, David's transgressions pierced its mark. This was going to be David's battle against himself, the biggest battle he would ever face. Without realizing it, he was entering in a long war that would be entirely fought internally. This battle was going to be won or lost in his mind, in his thinking, in his heart, and in his character. So when you think about this, it, it, when I thought about this, it occurred to me that this battle against self is something we, as people today, constantly have to battle. How many times have, have we been stuck in a bad state of mind and, and we start to blame ourselves or justify ourselves for something that we know is wrong. I think we've all done it. I know I have. But David knew the consequences of violating God's law. Leviticus 20.10 tells, tells us that if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Back in 2 Samuel 12, when Nathan was telling David the parable of the rich man, taking the poor man's uh, lamb for a feast, he could not see the parallel. Let's see what David says in verse 5. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Now, it's really difficult to see the emotion in, in text as we read. So while Nathan was telling David this story, David was really getting mad. And when he makes his judgment on the rich man, I don't think he just made a statement of fact. I actually think he said it loudly, forcefully, and with rage. And in response, I think Nathan came at David with the anger and authority of God as he laid the charge in front of David in verse 7. See, Nathan says, You are the man, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Then in verse 13, David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Now this brings us to, to Psalm 51. And 
This psalm begins this way. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. David's adultery with Bathsheba is right out in the open for us, written in the Bible for the whole world to know. So this poem or song is David's reflection about his sin and repentance and that were recorded for us in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. What is repentance? Repentance means turning, turning away from sin, turning away from disobedience, turning away from rebellion against God, and turning to God, turning to do what is right. So verse 1 of Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Do you notice the basis for forgiveness? David did not ask the Lord to forgive him because he deserves it or because he had earned God's forgiveness because of his good works. No, he appealed to God for forgiveness on the basis of who God is, God's nature, God's character, because God is a God of love and mercy. The first six verses of Psalm 51, David is confessing his sin and asking God to blot out his transgressions. It was David admitting he was racked with guilt because of his sin, and, and he knew he was born with sin or had sin nature. The next six verses are David asking God to purify him, to wipe away the guilty deeds, to return to the joy of God's salvation. In the remaining verses, David asks God to deliver him from certain death because of his sin, and he will praise him. He will teach others God's ways. He will sing of God's righteousness. What, my, what caught my attention was reading uh, while reading this chapter was verse 7. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Why did David say, purify me with hyssop? What is it about hyssop that it would cleanse him? Hyssop is mentioned in the Bible less than a dozen times, and mostly in the Old Testament. Hyssop is an, is an herb, and today... Nobody really knows which herb it, it was. The Bible, uh, I mean, the Hebrew word used was izab, which meant holy herb. And when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, it was translated into hyssop. Now, most scholars think it was in the mint family. And today we know about 3,500 members of that fall within that family. The bottom line is that no one can tell you which herb is the hyssop we read about in the Bible. But let's take a look at where hyssop was mentioned throughout the Old Testament. The first mention of hyssop is in the Bible is Exodus chapter 12. This is where Moses gives instructions to the elders about the first Passover. Verse 22, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Here, hyssop was used like a paintbrush to, to brush the lamb of the lamb sacrificed on the first Passover to the door protecting them from the angel of death. Then in Leviticus 14, it was used in the ritual cleansing of a person who had been healed of leprosy. Verse 4, the, the priest shall command them to take for him, who is to be cleansed two live clean birds, a cedar wood, a scarlet yarn, and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in the earthen vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird in the cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Later on in Leviticus 14, God provides instructions on cleansing the mold or mildew from one's house. The original Hebrew uses the same word for leprosy as if the house had leprosy. Verse 49, and the cleansing of the house, he shall take two small birds with cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop and shall kill one of the birds in the earthen vessel over fresh water and shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet yarn along with the live bird and dip them in the blood of the bird that was killed and in the fresh water and sprinkle the house seven times. Thus he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the fresh water and live and with the live bird and with the cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn. 
In Numbers, God is giving Moses and Aaron the laws of purifications. Numbers 19.6 is about the purification of the Israelites. And the priest shall take cedarwood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire, burn, um, burning the heifer. Verse 18 is about the purification of the dwelling and its contents as a person who touches someone who dies. Then a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it on the tent and all the furnishings and on the person who were there and on whoever touched the bone or the, of the slain or the dead or the grave. So when God asks, when um, Solomon, um, when God asked Solomon what he wanted most, the young King Solomon replied, wisdom. God granted him this and he had more insight than anyone in Israel and beyond to the East and Egypt. As the word spread about him, his fame grew and many came from far and near to hear him speak. He was the wisest of all people. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts, of the birds and the reptiles and, and of fish. So this passage about hyssop in the Old Testament um, is the only one that is not connected with the blood of animal sacrifices. Um, it represents God's compassion. So hyssop represents God's passion, compassion on his people. Now he will... Um, how he's willing to reach down to save and heal us. Psalm 51 celebrates this and shows the impact that this process can have on a person's life. David knows he needs spiritual renewal and realizes that this kind of ritual cannot be done by human hands. It is more intimate than an outward washing or sprinkling. Rather, it is the work done within the heart. So in Psalm 51 verse 17, he says the the way to please you is to truly is to be truly sorry deep in our hearts this is the kind of sacrifice you won't refuse see david understood what moves god he understood that all the great works he has done for god was not going to justify what he did to bathsheba and uriah the bible previously described david as a man after god's own heart and he knew that god wouldn't and couldn't say no to a person who was broken who was repentant, who sought his forgiveness. Keep in mind that David, um, what David did was punishable by death, but instead of carrying out that punishment, God showed him mercy. Now we're going to turn to the New Testament, which brings us to the book of John, chapter 19, where hyssop is mentioned. Jesus had been arrested, had been tried, beaten. Now he's hanging on the cross. So, starting in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, I'm, I thirst. A jar of, full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Roman soldier used the hyssop branch, which has a lot of symbolism, to give Jesus a drink of sour wine on a sponge. Sour wine is nothing more than wine that has gone bad and it's to the point of turning into vinegar. And there are, are a lot of commentaries about sour wine and how it all fits within the Passover setting. But there isn't much about John, uh, John's intentional mention of the hyssop branch. If you, th if you think about where they were, there had to have been many more short branches um, of other sorts than hyssop. We know that there were olive branches, olive trees around Jerusalem, and somewhere near there had to be palm trees. Remember, Palm Sunday was just a few days before. But maybe there was nothing but hyssop around the location of the crucifixion. So as I pondered this, what occurred to me as I was thinking about the soldier using a hyssop branch, was that God was reminding everyone of Exodus 12, 22. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood. Every Jewish person who witnessed this would have been reminded of the first Passover in Egypt when Moses told the elders to use the hyssop and paint the door with the sacrificial lamb's blood. When this Roman soldier unwittingly stroked the hyssop branch across the mouth of Jesus, 
he collected and smeared the unblemished sacrificial lamb's blood on his face. Why is this important in the setting of Passover? Look at John 10, 9. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. The, Ro the Gentile Roman soldier painted the door with the blood of the sacrificial lamb for the world. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God could have reacted with wrath, but he didn't. He reacted with patient mercy by establishing a covenant of promise with mankind that a savior would arise from the seed of a woman who would crush the serpent's head. And that promise or covenant was sealed with blood when God sacrificed an animal and used the skins to clothe Adam and Eve. Then God revealed himself to Abram and established a covenant of promise with him. The Lord would bless Abram and that covenant too was sealed with blood, circumcision serving as the sign of the covenant. The people of Israel, they came to Mount Sinai and God makes another covenant with the people through Moses. God gave them a special way to live in the promised land. He gave them the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Covenant. The people responded, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And the covenant was sealed with blood. The problem was the Israelites didn't do all that the Lord had spoken. They sinned time and time again, and they broke the covenant relationship with God. David was handpicked by God because he had a heart after God, but he fell into sin. We aren't any better than the Israelites or David. We've all sinned over and over again and deserve to be cut off from the covenant. But God, in his unending mercy, provides us a new covenant, one that is sealed with the blood of Jesus. So every year at Passover, the high priest would take the chosen lamb and sacrifice it to God to atone for the sins of Israel. But that lamb had no choice. So what is the mercy of the cross? It was Jesus, the Lamb of God, willingly served the death, death sentence that was meant for you and me. He wasn't forced to be the sacrificial lamb. He willingly laid down his life. John ten eighteen says, No one takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again, just as my Father commanded me to do. So as we come to a close, I want us to remember that just like what King David experienced, our sin will take us into situations where we never intended to go. Sin will take us there faster than we ever thought we would go. Sin will take us farther than we ever thought we would go. Sin will keep us longer than we want to stay. And sin will always cost more than we want to pay. But there is good news. The mercy of God is that we, as sinners, were not given what we deserved. Instead, God directed his wrath on his own son, who willingly took the punishment on our behalf. Now we see that God has a purpose in his mercy. There is a purpose in his patience. Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says it, says it really well. The Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises, as some people think he is. In fact, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. God does not wish that any should perish, so he gives us the time to repent. Amen. So I have this question for you guys. Are you merciful? <laughs> Thank you, Chuck, for that. Um, you know, have you been merciful? Do you see God's mercy in your life day in and day out?